welcome back. Um, in this lecture, we're going to talk about something called model view view model. Uh, it's a design pattern. It's used very commonly with GUIs and, and um, other similar kinds of, of, of setups. Uh, last class, we talked about building GUIs with JavaFX, um, including uh, FXML files. Uh, and then using Scene Builder for drag and drop to put those FXML files together. Um, today we're going to look a little deeper at the structure of JavaFX and how it relates to a, a, this design pattern called MVVM or Model View View Model. So going back to CS1 a little bit, we, we discussed this idea of separation of concerns which is closely related to SRP, or the Single Responsibility Principle. In SRP, every object has one responsibility that it should, be, should handle, and all of its services or all of its methods um, should be closely aligned with that responsibility. They all act, work together for the, the common cause of that object. With separation of concerns, we take our overall application and we break it into distinct features or, or concerns that um, have as little overlap in their functionality as possible. Um, and our goal with this is to promote something called high cohesion, which means that the, the concerns in our, um, in our application uh, are, you know, individually are working toward one specific goal. Um, and then this idea of low coupling, where the individual concerns are very loosely connected to each other. Um, the more loosely they're connected to each other, the better we can do. We can handle things like reuse and, and maintenance, and just generally find out where bugs are um, when, when we have to go through and do debugging. So model view separation is one. Um, way we can accomplish a separation of concerns. Um, you've seen models and views, you know, starting with CS1 up, up until the present, um, and we've just kind of made have, had that in the background where um, we would separate things into model and view uh, packages and concerns, but we didn't talk too much about them. Now we're going to explain kind of why we did that. So when we talk about our program's model, we're talking about the inner core logic of the application. Um, everything about it is non-visual. It doesn't interact with the user in any way. Um, some textbooks and, and professors will call this the business layer. It's everything that describes the core elements of our application. So in some of the projects we, we've done up to this point, things like a student class, a roster class, a dealership, a, uh, an insect, a, a bug, all of these are um, model classes. They describe in an abstract way the um, things our, our application will, will operate on, but they don't present them to the user in any, in any particular way. You know, we don't have to, to display a bug one way or the other. It's just how the computer thinks about and reasons about a bug. So separate from the model is this idea of the view. The view is stuff that a human can inter interact with. It's the parts we see, the parts we hear, the parts we read, and then the, the parts that we give feedback to the computer with, whether it's typing, clicking on uh, window elements, or you know, other kinds of things. It's, it's the, the barrier between the, the computer and, and the person. Um, it's often called the presentation layer, um, and our GUI, our graphical user interface, is the view for these for the applications that we've been talking about. Um, if you when you do get into web development, the presentation of uh, of a web page is the is your view, and behind it, um, usually on the server, but sometimes um, you know your JavaScript and things like that in the browser, um, are your model elements. Um, but those are things that you don't see. Um, ideally, model and view should never meet. Um, we want as clean a separation between these things as possible. Um, in CS1, when, when I talk to my students there, um, giving an overview of separation of concerns and 
um, a model view and that sort of thing. I talk about Microsoft Word, the, the core uh, model document structure in Microsoft Word has been relatively unchanged uh, for multiple uh, versions of Microsoft Word. What changes every time we, uh, we, we, we are forced to upgrade or purchase a new version of Microsoft Word is the view. So the document itself yeah, doesn't change much. It's just the, we, they come up with a new GUI, maybe arrange to add a few new visual features and things like that, um, but that underlying model doesn't change much. So they can reuse that model from version to version um, and save the, the, the expense of redeveloping it each time. Um, and all the, and you know, most of what happens when we upgrade is we change the GUI interface that uh, the user interacts with. Um, why do we do this? Um, why do we why do we separate the model and view? Um, you know, one good you know example here is we it allows us to work on a variety of devices. We can write one model, and that model will work whether you're on a desktop web-based application, a, f a smartphone based application, tablet, TV, smart TV, anything like that, the model stays the same across all those platforms. But the only thing we do change is the view we use to access the model on each of those platforms. So the model becomes a, a, a very large chunk, a very valuable chunk of reusable code um, across all those platforms. So when we're developing um, our desktop and mobile and, and so forth applications, we want to have as our goal to decouple the model objects from the user interface objects. Um, and in fact, they may even be two different development teams. You know, we have people who are user interface experts who are much better at designing that and they talk to the model people, but there may be a separate team that develops the model um, under the hood and, and works on that. Um, so this in, allows us to reuse what we call domain objects, and domain objects are those things that go inside the model. Um, and the, the, if, if this, this is separated well enough, changes in the interface don't really affect the model. So we can change what's in the interface, but not uh, have to re rebuild our model or not have to update our model uh, code in any way, if, if we're lucky. At the very least, the, we, we want to try to keep those changes as minimal as possible. Um, and then, kind of similar to what I mentioned in the earlier slide, we can create new views, new user interfaces that can access the model. So again, you, might, you may have started out as a desktop application, but if you have good separation between your, your GUI view and your model, you can easily port it to a smartphone application just by changing the view code. So we're going to design our model classes so they're not tightly coupled with the view classes. Um, the view classes should have little or no direct visibility to classes in the model. Um, and then our model classes do not know about the view at all. They don't care which user interface is accessing them. They just know they're being told to do things. Um, so the the view you know ma makes calls on uh, methods and, and services in the model, and the model responds and gives data back. But the model doesn't really see what see the view in any way. It just knows somebody's asking for for service. Um, so we're going to use this thing called the model-view-view model um, software design pattern to facilitate uh, this separation of concerns. So tangent about software design patterns for a moment. You know, there came a point as computer science matured where practitioners of the art, uh, people who were doing a lot of programming and a lot of software development, started noticing that certain patterns of, of or certain common solutions to problems were, were being used over and over again. Um, and they decided to call these patterns. Um, 
the, and the idea of a pattern is that it is a time-tested, well-worn solution to a, a recurring problem. Um, sometimes it's not specific code to tell us how to solve a problem, but it's a general approach or a template or a pattern of how to how to design that that that, that pro of how to so solve that problem. Um, and they're not in general tied to any particular programming language. Um, like I said, most of the time they don't provide code, um, but they they can be transformed into code. Now, some languages handle certain design patterns better than others. As you gain experience, you'll you'll start to see which which do and which excuse me don't. Um, so we're going to be learning about the MVVM pattern today, called the model view or view model pattern. I believe in CS1 we talked a little bit about one called MVC, the model view controller pattern, which is closely related, um, but a, a different variant on this idea. So design pattern benefits. Um, it can speed up our development process because we already have a, an, a very good idea about how to solve a problem. You know, again, we don't have the code to do it, but we, we have an approach that we know has been well tested and well um, well used in the past, and we can start with that as the basis um, for our design. Um, this does encourage reuse. Again, we're reusing something that that, that is known. Um, it's language neutral, so you know we can have a one design pattern to to solve our problem, but we could potentially implement it in multiple languages, um, depending on what 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 language features they provide. Um, team communication, you know, if, if you have several members on the team who are already familiar with the with the pattern, then right away you've got a you've got a benefit that we're all on the same page and you know what goal you're working towards. Um, and similarly related to the communication, it improves the code readability, readability for you know the other people on your team, the other developers who already know how that pattern works. So. Here's a statement that kind of sums things up. Design patterns are recurring solutions to software de design problems you find again and again in real world application development. Patterns are about design and interaction of objects, as well as providing a communication platform concerning elegant, reusable solutions to commonly encountered programming challenges. And this is from the book Structured Finance by Sherabini and Munga. Um, not all Patterns are, um, are are these abstract UML diagrams and things that, that we, we, we sometimes display them as. You often see design patterns come about as new language features. Um, a good example is the for each loop in Java. The for each loop came about because we were doing a very specific version of the conventional for loop time and time again. Um, it's you know a a version where we would simply enumerate all the elements of a collection or something that was collection like and operate on each one of them individually it didn't matter where they were in the collection it didn't matter about this whatever the i equals 0 i equals 1 it didn't matter what the loop index was um, but we had to simulate that using the the conventional for int i equals 0 type loop um, so the for each loop came about because there were a lot of special cases of that conventional loop that could be accomplished without so much um, syntax. And so they, they developed that and now we, we have that because it satisfies a pattern in programming. So let's talk about MVVM for a minute, the, the model view, mute view model uh, pattern. So when we talk about our model, also called our domain model, these are the, the model objects that we've had in those model packages before, things like the student, the roster, the dealership, the inventory. They are abstract representations of the concepts our application uh, manages. You know, our student class doesn't tell me what a student looks like or doesn't tell me what a, how we interact with a student, um, you know, via the keyboard or a mouse, but it does say, here's the data that encapsulates a student. Here are the operations we can perform on a student. And so those abstract concepts become our, our model or our business layer. 
I said before, our view is the, is the user interface. So it's all of the widgets and components on that user interface, their arrangement, um, AKA, uh, you know, their layout on the screen. Um, everything that the user sees on the screen is our view. It's also called the presentation layer. Um, in Java effects, that FXML file defines these things, defines where those components go, defines what those components look like. Um, in JavaFX, there's this code behind or controller class that is um, a code representation of those uh, controls and, and, and arrangement and stuff on the, the view, and it allows us to manipulate those things programmatically. In particular, things like what happens when you click a button or what happens when you type something into a text box. Sitting between these two is something called the view model. Um, and it mediates communication between the view and the model. And it uses something called data binding. It represents the state of all the elements on the GUI. So for example, it would have a, a, a data member that holds the text you just typed into a text box, or whether it, or a true false based on whether a checkbox has been checked or not checked, or um, well, those are, those are the two main things I can think of off the top of my head. But those would be the state of the current GUI, and it can and it takes that state and it communicates it back to the model um, in any way that we need to update the model or read from the model. Um, similarly, if something else changes the state of the model, the view model communicates those changes back to the, to the view. So it becomes, becomes an intermediary layer between the view and the model um, to keep those, those things separate. So. Here we, we, we see kind of a, a representation of something I hinted at earlier. Um, we have different people on our development team who um, are better at certain tasks than others. Um, one of them is the designer. The designer is, is good at making user interfaces. So they're good at thinking through how our program interacts with the user. Um, and that's a very, um, difficult skill to learn. Um, they're good at building those user interfaces. On the other hand, our developers are better at thinking about the, the model data and thinking about how that interacts with the view. So right away, we have this separation of concerns between the UI and the model and view model um, in terms of who does what. Um, and other things we get from this, we can test each of these uh, entities separately um, if we separate them out really well. All right, we mentioned this earlier, but the idea behind MVVM is facilitated by the notion of property bindings. So our, think about property bindings as, at, at a very high level, Imagine you have a, a text box in your GUI. You type something into that text box. You want it to immediately be reflected in both a view model and potentially in the model as well. Um, now, we could write code that manually moves that stuff over, but instead we have this notion of property bindings where we have a property for that text box in the view and a property for that text in the, in the view model. And we set it up to where those two things are linked. Whenever the text changes in the view, it automatically changes in the, the view model. Um, that's a very powerful idea because we don't have to write any additional code. Once we've created the binding, the data flows automatically from one to the other. Um, and it's, again, it's an automatic update. So we don't have to say, get the text out of the view, move it into the view model. It happens for us automatically. It's, it's a really ni nice thing. And we can set things up so that if it changes in the view model, we can, if we need to, pass that along to the model as well. 
So here are some of the, the property classes in Java effects that, that we will um, be playing around with. For every one of our um, primitives, like int, double, and boolean, we have an associated property type. So int for integer property, uh, double property for double, boolean property for boolean. And then we go farther with things like a string property for string, object property for object, list property for list. Uh, notice they're all abstract classes, but we will have some concrete variants of them that we will be able to use. So taking a look at uh, string property itself, here is the hierarchy of classes. Um, starting with the abstract string property class, um, there is a string property base which uh, encapsulates a lot of useful things that a, a concrete string, pro string property class would use, but it is still a, an abstract class. So usually if we're going to create our own version of string property, most of the time we're going to start out by extending string property base because it'll have a lot of useful stuff in it for us. Getting down into more concrete variants, there's the simple string property. We'll use that quite a bit. Uh, and there's even a variant called the read-only string wrapper, which um, I'm not familiar with it personally, but looking at the name, I'm guessing it is a string property that can only be read from and not, not changed. So the idea behind a, a JavaFX property is it'll wrap some data, like a, a primitive or a string or, or whatnot, um, and uh, it's something that can be notified when its, ch its state changes. So a property doesn't just wrap the data, but it can also be told how to change that data. In other words, it can be notified to change that data. And then even more advanced, we can bind that property to another property object somewhere else. Meaning that uh, up, you know, when the data in one changes, it will notify the other one, which will change its data accordingly. Um, typically, we um, provide getters and setters for our JavaFX properties. Um, they also internally have their own getters and setters for um, getting and setting the, their, their values. So, talking about data binding, in this case, we have two properties. Both are string properties, which internally hold a, hold a string object, and they're bound together. So if this one's string changes, it will automatically tell this one to change its string as, as well. Again, automatic updates. Um, it's, a, it's a very powerful abstraction once you get used to it um, for, for building GUIs because we have a, a lot of these things that change on a GUI and we want that update to immediately be reflected in, um, in our view model. So we have two types of bindings. One is called unidirectional, um, and it is um, one direction only. So we can bind A to B so that when B changes, A will as well. But it doesn't go the other direction. So it only propagates changes from one, one property to another. And we use the simple bind method to set this up. So we could say property A dot bind to property B. So now when property B changes, property A will as well. Then there's also bidirectional or two-way bindings. Um, when we do this, if, we set, if either thing changes, the other will. And so we can do that with property A dot bindirectional to property B. So here's some examples of how to do that. Uh, we have two string properties here. Note we've, we declare them as string properties, which are abstract classes, but we're assigning them um, concrete, simple string property objects. So a and b, a dot bind directional to b. If I take a and set its value to hello, b will automatically, oops, get updated to hello. If I take b and set its value to world, A's value will change to world as well. Now, if we had unidirectional, in other words, if we did A.bind B, 
and we tried to set the value of A to something, it would actually throw a runtime exception. It would not allow us to do that. A can only be changed by its binding uh, from B. We can change uh, the value of B using set value, and when we do, the value of A changes as well. So bindings between the view and the model. Um, we want to establish uh, connections between the application UI, the view or the, or the GUI, um, and the domain, which is the model. So the infrastructure that enables that linking, uh, the data objects to the properties of, of controls is the bindings. Um, so we bind single objects or collections to UI controls. We use the view model layer to create those bindings between um, the UI controls properties, which are the source of our data, and the view model properties, which are the target of our data. So kind of in the abstract, it looks like this. We have our view, which is our FXML plus our code behind, which has da data bindings with properties in the view model. And then the view model will manipulate the methods uh, of the model itself. So the view and the model are completely separated from each other. The view model manipulates the model, the view manipulates the view model. All right, so let's look at the Hello World um, MVVM starter uh, project. So you may want to pause for a moment and download that and open it in, in Eclipse. Um, so this is a Hello World project using the MVVM pattern. Uh, we'll, we'll go through this in a, in a minute. All right, hopefully you've got uh, everything opened up. So we're going to talk about uh, the various bindings um, as well as uh, how we, we bind them to controls. start by running this. I don't think it does much yet, but um, oops. there we go. So right now we've got a label that says hello, comma, with nothing after it. Uh, we can input our name and we can submit. I don't think it does anything right now. Yep. Let's dig down into the code. First of all, let's take a look at our model just so we're, we're on board with what it is. It's a person object. A uh, person has a constructor, which is probably their name. And then we have a way to get their name. So just a fairly simple data class of a person who has a name. And then we have our hello to fxml uh, class. Let's see if I can open the scene builder. I may not have scene builder yet installed. That's fine. We don't need it. Um, let's look at the code behind here. Um, in fact, let me run it again and you can we can see how what each of these things corresponds to. So in my code behind that text field goes along with with this uh, text box. This button goes along with submit. Um, the greeting label is this label here. It certainly currently just says hello. And then the text area, the, called all names text area, is this text area. So these are the actual objects or components that um, are on the GUI itself. And right now we have an initialize and a handle submit, neither of which are doing anything. So if I'm remembering correctly, what we want to do is, um, first of all, create a, a, a code behind, or a, a view model, so let's do that. I'm going to turn off my check style for now, just because it'll get in the way for the moment. And what I want in my view model is a property to, to mirror each of the interesting things on my GUI, each of the interesting pieces of data on my GUI. So pulling that up, 
that would be the label here, the name that goes inside this box, and whatever data shows up inside this box. The button doesn't, doesn't really hold any data, so we're not going to make a property for it. Um, we just want the, the data for the label, the text data for the name, and then the text data that appears in uh, this text area. So let's create properties for each of those. The first we'll do as a string property. Um, Greetings label property. And I need to import string property. Oops. I also need one for the name text box. Okay, well, let's take the idea of label out there. We'll just uh, make that the greeting property. Private string property for the name property and then private string property for the all names property so ultimately these properties in our model our view model will be bound to each of the items here so green property will be bound to this label Name property will be bound to this text area, or sorry, this text box, and the all names property will be bound to this text area. So, for starters, let's just go ahead and do a greetings view model constructor without anything in it. We may do something, we're probably going to add something to it in a bit. Um, but for now, let's create getters. For each of those properties. Don't create setters because we don't want to change the objects themselves. All right. And now I just remembered what I need to put in my constructor. I actually need to instantiate each of these things in my constructor. So this dot greeting property equals new simple string property. That's good enough for now. I think I need to import that. Okay. This dot name property is also a simple string property. And this dot all names property is also a simple string property. Okay, so right now I've got the, the basics of my, of my view model set up. It's got the properties it needs, it's instantiated them, and it has getters for each one. And those are going to be important because we're going to go to our greeting code behind. We're going to give it an instance of the view model. And we're going to instantiate this and initialize. The one oddity about the code behinds of, of FX, FXML, or sorry, of JavaFX, is we use initialize to handle what would normally go in our constructor. Like that. Let's also go ahead and do our data bindings. Um, so each of our text field label and text area will have its own um, property internally that's related to it. Let's do the label first. So this dot greeting label dot get uh, is it the get text property? I think it's text property. There we go. So that is that's the prop the string property of the text that shows up in the greeting label. And we can bind that. We're gonna 
let's bind it bidirectional. I may change that later. To this dot view models get greeting property. So with that one statement, I've connected the text property inside my greeting label to the greeting property inside my view model. I'm going to do the, uh, the same for the rest. So this dot uh, name text field, it also has a text property. Bind by directional. Oops. property and this dot all names text area dot text property gets bind by directional to the view models um, get all names property so that sets up all the bindings between the view and the um, and the greetings view model um, still won't do much. I mean, if we were if we were to run it right now, we wouldn't we wouldn't see anything change visually. Um, but the bindings are there. Now let's make this so we can actually do something with that button. I'm gonna write a method. Update view model in my greetings. And I'm not going to do anything with it yet. I'm just going to tie it into my code behind. There. So now when I click my button, it's going to call the relevant um, actions inside my, my greetings view model. Um, and just if you want to see something happen for now, We'll do a system.out.println um, update the view. So now if we run, I, well, let's make sure. Let's see the console here. Every time we click, we can see that something's actually happening. Um, right now, that's just to, to um, you know, show that there's a connection between the two things. All right, at this point, I don't think we need to do anything more in the code behind. Everything's set up. We've uh, connected the, the views uh, properties to the, those in the view model, and we've connected the button press to an action in the view model. So let's do everything else here. Um, if I'm remembering correctly for this, we want to take the name that's put in the text box and um, run it in and add it to the, the all text box. And just to make sure, let me run my um, solution here. to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Oops. Oops. Pick up these arguments. I think that'll do it. Changes that. I've forgotten about that part, and it adds it to the area at the bottom. Okay, I want to make sure I was doing the right thing. And we'll close that out. Okay, so we're back in our view model. Let's uh, first of all let's handle just changing the label. Okay, so we've called update view model. Let's see what the name that was put in our name property is.
And then let's also get new label text to be hello, its name, plus an exclamation point. So that's what we want to appear in the label text. And then we'll take this dot greeting property dot set it to be the new label text. And then we'll run that. Hopefully I'm running the right one. There we go. So I put my name in, I hit submit, and it um, changed my label text. There we go. Now let's make sure that it uh, updates and adds to the, um, the all text area at the bottom. So string all names is this dot all names property. We'll get our text there. Let's say all names equals all names plus a system dot line separator plus our new name and then we'll set that all names property to all names what we just did so that should update it as well all right let's run and i think we'll have everything good to go here oh there was a null in there probably need to Need to fit, need to put in a, an if statement to handle that, but let's keep going. Yep, Sally got added. John got added. Cindy, and so forth. So if we were doing this right, we would account for that null, but this video is already getting too long. <laughs> so there you have it. The solution to this is also posted, so you feel free to look at that. Um, I believe another professor came up with that solution, so you might get a different view on that. Um, but you can also use the code that I've given you here. All right, so some um, review on the various pieces here. Um, our model, is uh, what we also call the domain, um, is independent from the user interface. Um, it only has those abstract classes and objects that represent the core of our business. The view model has all the logic for the presentation. And by logic, I mean it tells us what happens when uh, we click a button. It doesn't handle the button click, but it is the action that occurs when we, when we click that button or when you know, a mouse clicks elsewhere or, or data is input and that sort of thing. It has the state of the, of the user interface without having user interface elements. So a user interface element or a control for a text box would be the visual representation of the text box and the data inside of it, but the view model only holds the text that was typed into it via, the, via bindings to the, the view, view itself. So any, uh, any, any events that take place in the view are handled in the view model. Then it communicates with the model on the back end. The view displays data from the view model, um, takes any user input and passes it to the view model, and it updates um, its own state uh, in, in the view, view model. And we've kind of seen all those things as we went through. Uh, here's just a uh, refresher on the data bindings, uh, things that I've done already. Uh, I did a one Here they're doing a one-way binding between um, the greeting label and um, and the view model, I did I did bidirectional, but you know probably makes more sense to do a to do a one way for that particular one. And we can change what's in a property using its set. We can also read what's in a property by using its get. All right, from here on out, I, I want you to to take care of a couple things. There is another uh, project called the CS2 MVVMS Sandbox. Uh, 
I'm going to demo that and show you what happens, and then we'll talk through some of the code in it. I don't believe there's a code along with this, though. this one. So here's the MVVM sandbox and we have a student is the model. The student has a name and a grade and getters and setters for those things. Um, let's run this. Show you what happens. So if I put a name in and a grade, and I do update student, it shows me some summary information for that. Um, now the simulate model view data change, what it will do is it will add um, five points to my grade in the background, and that automatically reflects on um, the model here. So this is a two-way two data binding on the grade. Now, notice it didn't update it in the summary because that is only updated if I click that button. So, this changes the grade in the background. Reflect the, the new, new value is reflected here. Um, and then I can click Update Student to pass that along to this other uh, component on my screen. So let's look at, at how that's happening in the view model. Well, first of all, in the view. So the view has a text field for the name, a text field for the grade, and a text area for the summary. Um, it has an instance of the view model, which we've set up in the, in the constructor here. Um, and in there initialize, we put some default values for, for some things, um, and set up some of the controls. And then we have a helper that's binding our controls, and it's similar to what we saw before. The name text fields text property is being is using a bidirectional binding to the name property of our view model. The grade text field is doing a bidirectional binding to the grade property of our view model um, with a st number string converter. And we'll have a slide a little while later that explains because the, this is a, a text property in the view but an integer property in the model, we have to have a converter that converts from the string to the number and vice versa. And so that's what's happening here. And then we have a, a bidirectional binding from the summary text field to uh, the summary info in the view model. We have a couple of uh, helpers here. One is um, to handle the button press when we simulate the model view data change and it just calls the simulate data change in the view model. And then we have a handle update student, which calls a related action in the view model. So we try to not do any logic inside these button press handlers. We offload the logic of what that means to the view model. So let's pull that up. Um, it has a student for its model that it's gonna be manipulating, it has a name property, a grade property, and a summary property. Notice that the grade property is an integer and not a string. Um, it initializes those things, um, has getters for each of them, and those were, those were used to um, in the bindings with the view. And then it has a couple of methods, one for updating the student, one for simulating the data change. So the update student, um, when that happens, we're going to set the name and grade of the student based on those same values in the, the properties. And we're going to use that um, the information in that student object to update our, our summary output. Now when we simulate the data change, um, we're grabbing the student's grade, we're adding five to it, changing the student, and we're changing the grade property. And this is what will reflect back here when we do the simulation. So simulate data change, took the grade, added five to it, and then updated the local property, which is bound to this text box's property here. And then if I update the student, that makes the changes reflect across there 
because we changed the student object. We use the student object's information to set our summary info. All right, let's see if there's anything I've forgotten. So uh, we looked at the, at the model, um, which is the, in this case was the student. Notice the student doesn't know anything about the view or the view model. It's being manipulated by the view model, but it doesn't have a reference to the view model itself. We looked at the view, uh, particularly we looked at the code behind, uh, but the FXML is also part of that. Um, and that code behind has an instance of the view model, um, and it sets up the bindings between the two. Um, and it only interacts with the view model, and has no direct knowledge of the model itself. The view model contains a model object and interacts with, with that model. Um, there are properties in the view that reflect the elements on the GUI itself. Uh, we created our bindings, we usually do those in initialize of, um, of the code behind. In one case, we needed a converter to convert between a string property and a number property. Happened right here. So uh, the, the text field that held the grade was, you know, the data in it is actually a text. Um, so when we do our bind directional with our view model's grade property, which is an integer, we have the new number string converter to, to do that. It's a, it's an object that will handle that conversion for us. And it works both ways. Um, it will take the text in the text box and convert it to an integer. It'll take the integer in the, in the view model and convert it back to, to text for us. Um, we could do this when it's passed in by a binding. Um, sometimes we can be the, between two uh, values of the same type. So we have a string property to a string property where we want to add in some formatting. So we might not store things in the background using a currency symbol, but we want them to display in the, um, the view using a currency symbol. All right, that's it for today. Um, as always, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask me or your, your instructor, and we will do the best we can. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you.